Good morning. Welcome to Glenville Methodist Church. My name is David. I'm the pastor. I'm so happy to see each and every one of you here for a very special morning of worship. We do have a few announcements, though, before we get started. Some things I want to lift up. Um, it's a little bit smaller crowd here. Me and Mr. Vic were just talking about that because at 11 o'clock we are going to have a confirmation at the end of the service where we confirm our confirmands who have gone through about nine different sessions about what it means to be a follower of Jesus and what it means to be a part of the church. And they're going to be joining the church and one of their parents are too. So that's exciting. And then after that, there will be a meal. And so if you don't have any lunch plans, please come back around noon. We'll be eating. Um, if you want to bring a side or a dessert, you can, but we'll have plenty of food and we're going to have fried chicken. I'm assuming we're having fried chicken. I think that's what it is. And so it's going to be a great time. I hope that you can come out for that meal. I'm excited. Our confirmation class um, is going to be Camden Corals, uh, Walker Hall, and then Luke Donnan. Um, Landon Brown will be recognized at a later day. He is not here today, but it's going to be a lot of fun. And of course, having your own son get confirmed in the church is extra special too. So I'm really looking forward to that. But the true jewel of the church ministry today is Daniel Smith leading the board meeting tonight at 6. So um, if you're on an administrative board, come out for that and finance will be right before that. Also send your middle schoolers and high schoolers out tonight, middle school at 5 and senior high, high school at 6 p.m. for you tonight. So a lot of great stuff happening in the church today. Also this week, Wednesday night, if you're coming for supper, we are going to do our uh, second attempt at Japanese and dessert. It was very, very good last time. Ton of compliments. You definitely want to come out for that. But make sure to let us know you're coming so we can have enough um, shrimp and chicken for everybody. It's going to be a big time. Also, there are extra hours at 5 and the choir practices at 7. Also, I just want to highlight the last announcement in there that I'll be Ray and JP, their uh, wedding shower is coming up, and you can see the information about that in there. All right, are there any announcements that you think we need to lift up for the better of the church this morning? Can I also pray? Yes. Oh, glory is oh, yeah, I got the flag back up there. Very cool. Exciting stuff. So thanks for that. Mr. Bill, you worked really hard on that. I think he climbed up to the very top of it. Is that what you did? And then had to slide back down, something like that. Well, thank you for your hard work and effort on that. All right. Anything else y'all want to lift up announcement-wise for the church? Well, I'm excited because while we don't have the confirmants here, we still have the Word of God that will be preached. We're going to be going on in our study through Luke, and it's been a lot of fun. And I look forward to sharing you about Jesus calling one of his disciples, and the sermon is called Grace to Change. So I'm really looking forward to sharing with you about that. But before we get to the sermon, we're going to spend some time uh, singing praises to God, praying for our friends and for the world. And I'm going to ask Mr. Vic to come and lead us in our opening prayer. provided the blessings in our lives as we prepare our hearts and minds to hear your message to us today we ask you to equip us challenge us and comfort us father show us the way in the week ahead give us courage and patience and understanding in order to face life's difficulties help us to remember your love and grace and be faithful in our service to you we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, Mr. Vic, for that beautiful prayer. We are going to start out by singing praises to the Lord. We're going to sing Majesty. It's 176 in the hymnal. And here I am, Lord. The words will be on the screen. Would you please stand?
Amen. Well, it is important for us to remember who we are and whose we are. And one of the ways the church has done this throughout time is by reciting the basics of our faith found in the creeds. Will you join me as we recite the Apostles' Creed? The words will be on the screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. While you're still standing, will you take a moment to greet those around you and the children may come forward for our children's moment. doing today all right we got Drummond, land and gray up here asa kate's over there too out of the four of y'all who do y'all think is probably the most responsible all right who do you think <laughs> Drummond, you don't think you are you're just gonna cede to gray all right gray i i was running a little bit behind today so can you help me out with something can you do me a favor all right, I'm going to give you my keys. All right, I need you to run over to my house for just a second, okay? Just take my van, all right? Turn the alarm off when you go in, okay? And then I forgot to feed Benny. So take Benny out. He's probably going to go outside for a minute. You know, the dogs have to go outside sometime. And then there's dog food beside his bowl. Put the dog food in there, okay? Let him eat. He probably needs to go outside again after that. All right, cl put him back in the house after that. Turn the alarm back on, get back in the van, drive back up here. And can you be back by the end of the service? What? I thought you were the most responsible one. You should, you're, you're the most, can you drive? No. Okay, all right, you can't drive. All right, give me my keys back. What am I doing here? Of course, that would be crazy to let you drive, wouldn't it? You think you could do it though, can't you? Maybe we'll put, you can get some books out of my office, sit up on them, maybe. Lane, you know how to drive? Okay, he's, he's not falling for that. Okay, when well, you can get a golf cart. So it's probably a little too much, Drummond, to give him the keys and have him go do that right now. Turn off the alarm and everything and feed the dog and get him back in. Yeah, that probably is a little too much. Um, sometimes, you know what adults feel like when they come to church? They feel like God saying, you've got to do this, 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 this. And they say, oh my goodness, I could never do that. I'm not ready. But I think that's a trick the devil plays on us sometimes. Here's what I think God really does. God says, I want you to do the one next thing. And usually it's something small. Like go to the back with Miss Anna and pay attention. Or maybe later when your parents tell you to do something, you say, yes, sir, or yes, ma'am. A lot of times we think God wants us to do a lot, but really he wants us to do just a bunch of little things right when he asks us to do it. So God's going to call you to do big things in your life, but the majority of the time it's just, God, help me be faithful with those little things that you want me to do. All right, let's do our echo prayer, guys. All right, I'll say a line and you say a line. Dear God, thank you for loving us and talking to us. Help us to remember to do the next small thing you want us to do. We love you. Amen. All right.
Well, thank you to the choir, just the trio today, but that was very beautiful and spoke to my heart and will tie into the message um, later on. So thank you so much for that. That was absolutely uh, beautiful. As we prepare our hearts for our morning time of prayer, um, Brandy's dad was in the hospital. He went in Friday night and he should go home today. Again, his um, fluids, mainly his sodium, continues to get off and has kind of pushed back his last treatment. Um, for his last round of chemo, and so we want him to be healthy and be able to get that done. So pr please continue to pray for Ricky McDowell. He's been on the prayer list for a little while, but just continue to pray for him. With that being said, what other names or situations would you like to lift up? And while you're thinking about that, if you're watching online, particularly on Facebook, if you have a prayer request, please put that in the comments there. What's going on in our community that you would like to lift up this morning? All right, I'm not seeing any in the room, so let's go to God in prayer. And at the conclusion of the prayer, I invite you to pray the Lord's Prayer out loud with me. Let's pray. Lord, in a week that started with us collectively looking up at the sky, noticing this 
unique partial eclipse experience in our area and um, other people who saw fully the light from the sun disappear, we want to say thank you for the wonders of this world. We thank you how the marvelous creation that we live in points to a creator, points to a God, points to order. God, we pray that the general revelation that is available through nature to all would also lead to this specific revelation that you are a God of love, that you are a God of morality, and you are a God of justice. God, we know that you are a God with high standards, and we also know we are keenly aware that we fall short of your standards, that we need your help. We need your forgiveness. We need you to change our heart, O oh Lord. God, we also acknowledge we cannot do this on our own. That there is no part of Christianity that is based on simply trying harder. But instead is about a God who reaches out to us first. You are the primary mover, God, coming to us saying, respond to my love. God, help us as we start this week to be people who respond to your love, who respond to your grace, who responds to the call of the Holy Spirit in our lives to change. As the psalmist says, create in me a clean heart. God, would you do that for us this week? May our cleaned hearts reflect your love in the way that we face the challenges before us. Help us to have gratitude, hope, and peace. God, in the midst of this broken world, we ask that there would be peace all over the world, particularly in places where there is unrest right now. And help us to not take the great land that we live in for granted. God, we pray this this morning in your son's name, and we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom. What a privilege to get to preach after that. Well, normally when I start my sermon out, I, I like to do something catchy or something to grab your attention. Um, but sometimes it's just uh, to have the ability to be in front of people. I just like to vent about stuff. And so this might not tie into anything. But I was thinking about uh, modern medicine. Brandy's dad, of course, has been in the hospital and, and battling cancer. And so it's very fascinating um, to have all my frustrations with modern medicine brought up again. I'm sure you've never ran into any issues with doctors or insurance or anything like that in your time. But um, it was one of those things where the doctor said, hey, I'm working with the other doctor. They're texting me back and forth, these readings, and, and you know, we're going to get this started so fast. And so as soon as they put the order in, well, we got to wait on insurance now. So things that are literally life and death are caught up with the insurance agencies. Um, and, and I know the way it works. Um, when, when you get the bill with the insurance, they'll have all this stuff. You're like, I didn't even have these things. And they know, like... Oh, well, let me see. Let me make sure I don't perjure myself here. Um, it seems that sometimes they overcharge knowing that some people won't dispute the bill. And so that's kind of a, a dirty practice that um, may be happening. Am I, am I covered there by saying that? It may be happening. So, um, so that can be frustrating. I can remember one time I got a medicine and I got to the pharmacy and they were like, we're waiting for approval. And I said, okay. And then it took like three weeks and finally it got approved. And I was like, well, I'm glad that's figured out. And then I went back to get it refilled and they're like, oh, we got to get approval again. And so every time I got a refill, like it had to be sent to the doctor's office and have them fill it out. Um, but a week ago, on and on about insurance but also sometimes there's things with doctors have you ever had a doctor come into a room and see a loved one and uh, maybe they didn't have the best bedside manner I don't know maybe that's never happened y'all but I've definitely seen that happen before and then you know it's a privilege as a pastor to be beside people as they go through and they battle illness and disease and I remember talking to one person and they were up in Atlanta seeing specialists and they're like okay we're supposed to see this specialist on Friday. This one's off over the weekend, so we're going to wait till Monday. And then this other one's waiting for another reading. And it was like, if you could just convince the 30 minutes that the specialist would be in the room, they could just go and, and get everything taken care of and go back. But it's, it's so frustrating how the process works. What about if you ever shown up for a doctor's appointment, be on time. If you later, if you're, if you're later, you cancel, you get charged like 100 bucks. And then you go and you wait and you wait and you wait hours sometimes or sometimes you go and wait and then they say oh the doctor had something come up we're gonna have to reschedule you You're like where's my hundred dollars you're gonna charge me a hundred dollars so our modern medicine let me go ahead and say is great I love modern medicine um, I think it is a, a huge blessing for us but I also say man it can be really frustrating sometimes 
All right, well, our sermon today is from the Gospel of Luke. Just to give you a recap in Luke, um, we have actually seen some miraculous things happen. Um, Jesus has started his ministry. He has called his first disciple, Simon Peter, um, and then he's done some healings. And then now he's going to call another one of his disciples and what we look at today. And also he's going to start doing some more teaching. So far, Jesus has been challenged and he's kind of uh, made a couple statements, but he's going to actually start using some illustrations here to really hammer down his point. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to the Gospel of Luke. We are going to finish up with chapter 5. We will have completed five chapters through the Gospel of Luke since last December. All right, we are going to start in verse 26, 27, and we're going to read through the end of the chapter, okay? After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi, Levi, sitting at his tax booth. Okay, so after this, he had just healed. There was a paralyzed man. Um, had the buddies dragged him through the roof and lowered him down. And, and Jesus was amazed by their faith. And he healed this man and forgave his sins, forgave his sins first. And then he healed the man. And so after that, Jesus is walking along. And he sees this tax collector, Levi, who is Matthew, um, sitting at his tax booth. And notice, um, we don't see that Levi initiates the conversation here. It is God who initiates this. He says this, follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. It's very similar to the story we looked at last week, where there is a paralyzed man, and Jesus says, get up, take your cot, and go home. In the same way, Jesus simply walks up and he says, get up and follow me. And Levi left everything and followed him. Now, he left everything. I think it means he left his business. Um, it was a very lucrative business to be a tax collector at this time. But it also cost you a lot socially. It helped you out financially, but it cost you socially. Um, so imagine, let's, uh, this is a scenario I like to use to kind of illustrate it. Imagine that um, all the Mounties from Canada, you know those guys with the top hat? Imagine Canada like invades and they put one of those Mounties in every little town and they have a booth and every time you walk by you got to give them some money. Um, but they say we can't run all these ourselves so we need somebody to help steal your hard earned money. And so they would say who wants to buy this booth and collect money? And so I could say, oh, I want to buy and get money from all the people in Glenville to send up to Canada but I'm going to get to keep some. Would I be a very popular person in town if I did that? No, probably not. It's like I'll be, um, I'm against the man, but also I'm working for the man, okay? Um, it would not be a great thing socially for me, but it would be very lucrative. Well, that's who Levi was. He was a Jewish person stealing money from the Jewish people to go to Rome and skimming off as much as he could. And so he has his little booth, he has his business, and he gets up and leaves it to follow Jesus. Verse 29. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. Okay, so he didn't leave exactly everything. He still kept his house at least, it seems. So he has this banquet and a large crowd of tax collectors. You remember those people who are getting really rich but are kind of considered outsiders from their community? All right, a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. Now, eating is a little bit different in biblical times. It's kind of like if you have somebody over to your house, maybe people will drive by and be like, oh, there's Daniel Smith's car over at David's. They must be eating. But if you would have went to Rusty Pig on Monday, you would have seen me eating with Daniel um, and David and some of their buddies from work. And you'd be like, okay, they at least hang out together. When you went to somebody's house to eat, it was more everybody could kind of see in when they were coming by. It was a social thing where people would notice. So they were eating them, but the Pharisees and the teacher of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? So they could either see coming by or they heard about it, and they said, why is Jesus eating with these sinners? And Jesus answers them, this is important, maybe this ties back into some of the health stuff in the beginning. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. 
Let me say that again. Actually, let's all read that together. Verse 31 on the screen. Start at the beginning with Jesus. One, two, three, go. Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And then he says this, and he kind of um, elaborates on what that means. He says, I have not come to call the what? Righteous, but who? Sinners to repentance. Um, and to call the righteous, I think he means the people who think they are righteous. He says, I'm not coming for the people who think they're good enough. I'm coming from the people who respond to me when I reach out to them, who know that they need health, who know that they are sick. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. This is kind of a, a microcosm. This is kind of a summary of Jesus' whole life and ministry. He has come for those who are sick, not those who think they are good enough. Now, I don't think this is necessarily a call for us to um, walk out of the door and put like a kick me sign on the back where people just kick us and we're supposed to remember how bad we are all the time. But I think it's a call for us to be humble. I think it is a call for us to say, man, I am saved. But it's not by what I've done. It's by this physician. It's by Jesus, who there are no co-pays. There is no waiting to see him. There is no calling and saying, I need to see you, Jesus. And they say, we're booked up for six months. I'll call you if there's a cancellation. But let me put you down for six months from now. That's not the way it works with God. God is here. God is the primary mover reaching out to each one of you. And it is on you to respond and say, God, I am sick with blank in my life. And I need your help. So here's what happens. They continue to question him. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours go on eating and drinking. And Jesus answered them, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and in those days they will fast. Jesus is pointing out, um, it's good that, uh, this isn't what Jesus is pointing out, this is what I'm saying here. I think it's good that people fast and practice those spiritual disciplines. And Jesus isn't saying it's bad that these people are doing them, that the Pharisees, that John's disciples are doing that. But he's saying this is a special moment in time. God in flesh is here and they are celebrating that. He says the friends of the bridegroom don't fast while he is with them. This is a special and unique time. And then he says this. This is what um, Angie had on the picture before this, this wineskin thing. Jesus tells this illustration and I think it kind of sums up good what the purpose of his ministry is. We kind of have the summary of what he's doing. He's, he's the doctor here to, here to heal the sick. But here's what he is talking about is going to happen. He told them this parable. No one tears a piece out of new garment to patch with an old one. Mr. Willie, we need Miss Judy here to help us understand this. Um, so I'm going to try my best to understand sewing. If any of y'all know sewing, y'all can help correct me here. Um, but if you have an old garment, like an like a old, let's say, sports coat, and it's really worn down, it's been in the sun, but it still kind of looks good and has shape and it has a giant hole in it, if you put in a brand new fabric in it, it's not going to work right. It's going to be too stretched. You really need something old to put in there. So no one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new one will not match the old. So it's this old and this new idea. The old and the new are not really working together. And no one pours new wine into old Wine skins. Now, I've never made wine before. I know some of y'all probably like put wine in a closet and made it that way. I was at a church one time and they said, well, that's how we used to have wine for communion, which we don't have wine for communion. We do grape juice so people who anybody can come and take communion. Um, but there, there's something I know. There's this process called fermentation. Okay, And if you have an old wine skin, actually, Angie, would it be too hard to put that picture back up on there or is that going to mess you up? Okay. So if you have one of these wine skins, um, after a while they get really hard. Um, they're kind of loose when they first get wine in them, but as the fermentation happens after a long time, it's kind of like an old uh, uh, leather 
a satchel or something. It patinas, it gets a little tougher, and actually looks a little bit better too. Um, same way with these pouches, the leather would get really hard and it wouldn't be as flexible. And so if you put new wine in it to ferment, it would just bust it out and all your grapes or whatever you were fermenting, scuppernongs or whatever, um, they just bust and uh, ruins the whole thing. So the idea is if you got, you already made your wine, that's probably all the use you're going to get out of that old wine skin. So no one pours new wine, this is verse 37, into old wine skins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and the wine will run out on the wine skin and the wine skins will be ruined. No new wine must be poured into the new wine skins. And no one after drinking the old wine wants the new for they say the old is better. This idea that um, new wine, I'm not a wine connoisseur at all by any means, um, but the newer wine hasn't fermented, so you prefer the older one. It's this idea that the old and new don't mix. This conflict with the Pharisees um, about, hey, Jesus, we want to live separate. We don't want to have to mingle with these people who are responding to you. We don't want to do this new thing that you are doing. Well, Jesus is showing that his way is new. And he's not necessarily saying, I'm trying to start a new religion. We've talked about how Luke's goal in writing this gospel is connect Christianity to Judaism. But he is saying he's doing something new in their lives. This is a new opportunity before them. All right, the only uh, job I ever got fired from, I've told you all this before, um, was at my dad's doctor's office. Um, I was the file boy. My mom reminded me of this the other night too. She's always, you know, good moms never let you remember a failure, I guess. Um, she was saying, yeah, you got fired. It's like the only job I got fired from was from working in my dad's office because I was too inefficient. I distracted all the nurses. I like to talk more than I like to file stuff. Now, filing was fun because you get to like see some of the stories of these medical episodes and what was happening. So I probably was reading all the stories and then filing it away and talking to the nurses and distracting and I got fired from that. But one of the cool things I did is I actually went and worked in a physical therapy clinic where you were not just filing stuff, you were moving around, you were changing um, ice bags out, you were cleaning filters, you were helping. They would say, oh, the timer went off on this patient, go take the um, ice or the heat off of them and help them in or out. And so I really enjoyed it. I um, also enjoyed the efficiency, getting patients in and out. My dad's office was super slow. It was ridiculous how slow he was. And after a little while, I made this observation to him. I said, Dad, there's something I've noticed, the difference between physical therapy and internal medicine is what he practiced. I said, your patients, you are managing their decline until they die. And this is kind of a, a morbid thing. If you go to the doctor, you want to say, I, I know I'm going to die one day. Help me get the most out of life and do better. But in physical therapy, people come in barely able to walk barely able to bend their knee, recovering from a stroke where they can't even swallow. And you see them get better and better each appointment. When I think about Luke recording and the Holy Spirit guiding him, I think he's right when Jesus says, you know, I'm a good physician. But I think a part of a good doctor back then was do, being a good physical therapist, was helping people if they broke a bone, learn to walk again and get better. And I think that's a helpful thing for us to think about. When Jesus comes into our life, it is to help us get better. It's not to manage our decline till we go on to glory. It is to change us, to put new wine in new wineskins, to make us better, to help us improve, to help us to go places we never could have gone on our own, to experience life in ways that we never could have. Now, that doesn't mean it's easy. There's always a disclaimer in here. This isn't the prosperity gospel where we're always going to get every little thing we want. But there may be some areas in our life where we were hobbling. Some areas we were barely getting by. And by God's grace, He calls us to change. He calls us to face those hard things in life. But to be able to handle them by His grace. Jesus is the great physician, the great physical therapist, the great healer. Praise God, he has not left us here alone. Like we sang earlier, change my heart, O God. God is the one who wants to do that. And it's by his grace that we are able to change. Would you pray with me? 
Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who wants to heal. You are a God who is the great physician, who sees us and says, I love you right where you are. I died for you right where you are. Yet you don't call us to stay the same. God, we confess that we can all be like the Pharisees and say, we just want to huddle over here with ourselves. We just want to do our own thing. We just want to um, decline and go on to glory. But God, you call us each and every day to take that faithful next step, to acknowledge our brokenness, to be humble and say, God, we need you. Lord, we thank you for modern medicine and the health care that we have, but we thank you most importantly that we have a healer in you. And there is no wait. We simply bow our heads or open our hands and say, God, help me with this. As we're praying right now, I want you to ask God, Lord, what is it that you want me to change? Where in my life do I need the great physician's help? And see if God lays anything on your heart today. I want you to pray this in your heart. You don't have to pray it out loud. Just pray it in your mind or in your heart. God, I want to change. I want to be the father, the uncle, the grandmother, the brother or the sister that you want me to be. Help me to change. Not by my own strength but by the guidance of your Holy Spirit. And God, when I feel myself sliding away, help me to run back to you and to trust in you as the great healer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn of response is 347 Spirit Song. We'll sing both verses. The words will be on the screen.
Well, thank you so much for being with us today in worship. I hope that you heard God speak to you in some way. I hope you know how much God loves and cares for you. Would you receive this benediction? Heavenly Father, as we go from this place, may your grace go before us and your face shine upon us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.